Um, okay, so thank you all. I'll go ahead and, and kick it off. Um, it's good to be here. Um, as, as Galen said, we do have our independence team here. So in addition to me, uh, we have Jazeep Mangat, Basilis Karapanos, and Matt Hodder. Um, so um, I know for some of you, you would have heard the presentation that Basilios and I did last year um, at the CAG meeting. Um, in fact, I think it was our last day in the office before we all went to uh, you know full-time telework. So, um, but we're happy to be here again with you and wanted to provide a refresh on last year's remarks. And also I understand you're interested in um, the recent amendments to the SEC's independence rules, but we'll talk about that. So um, next slide, please. So of course, I first need to give our standard SEC staff disclaimer that will apply to all four of us as the presenters today. And so just keep in mind that the views we expressed today are our own and the views do not necessarily reflect those of the commission, the commissioners or other members of the staff. So next slide, please. And again, um, these are the presenters today. And so I will start off with a brief overview of our independence consultations process. And following that, Jazdeep will provide an overview of the SEC independence rules in Rule 201 of Regulation SX. Then Vasilios will discuss the recent amendments to the SEC independence rules. And finally, Matt will finish off with a brief discussion of the PCOB independence rules and standards and, and the recent conforming amendments that they made as well. So next slide, please. So as I said, we'll start with the independence consultations process. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so just um, to give you um, a few reminders about our process, and I, and I will say too, I remember from my experience working with IOSCO Committee One that you know different regulators around the world have different processes. Some may have consultations processes, some may not, and they may be, and I think many are different from ours, so I think it's useful just to go through our process briefly. Um, and so we do think our consultations process with independence is in keeping with um, the broader mission and objectives of the SEC, which include to enhance investor protection and facilitate capital formation. The, our consultations process provides a mechanism for auditors and registrants to come in and talk to us and to evaluate um, either on a pre or a post filing basis, situations in which auditor independence may be impaired and action may be needed um, based on our existing rules and, and our staff guidance. Uh, we think also the process fosters a greater level of consistency across audit firms and over time in application of the rules. Um, it's also a, a good way for um, if auditors do have questions as to whether or not they, they might have an independence issue, it's better to talk to us up front um, and avoid costly re-audits um, later if they, if they later determine that they had uh, a problem with our under our rules. And so as looked on the slide, we do take both formal and informal questions. Um, as examples, we'll take questions about independence violations, um, but also, as I said, on the front end, interpretive questions about the rules. And how much we're able to say in each case will of course depend on, on the particular matter, the facts and circumstances, and then also the extent of detail that their requester is giving us. Um, formal written submissions will generally result in more substantive staff feedback from us. And I will speak more about that in a little bit. So next slide, please. Um, in terms of sources of consultations, um, we do of course take questions from the public um, as well as from other SEC offices and divisions. We most frequently interact with um, accounting firms or audit firms of all sizes, large, medium, small, everything in between. Um, and we also receive questions um, from companies, law firms, other regulators, um, and, and others as well. Next slide, please. So first, just talk about briefly about the informal consultations. Um, as noted on the slide, these questions generally relate to a specific provision or section of the SEC independence rules. Um, for example, it may be a specific partner rotation question or a specific type of non-audit service that the audit firm may be um, wanting to provide to a, an audit client. Um, 
as I said, the requesters are usually accounting firms and they're usually seeking guidance from us in advance of undertaking a service or entering into relationship when we get these informal questions. Um, because of the informal nature of the questions, our teams generally provide, our team generally provides more what we call directional guidance to assist the, the requester in understanding the rules. But, and so we do not provide formal, formal views on these types of questions. Um, the informal consultations process has also been very useful recently and a good mechanism for people to bring us questions about our recently amended um, SEC independence rules and the changes. And so we'll, we'll, Vasilios will talk a little bit more about that when we get to his section. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of the formal consultations, um, as noted on the slide, formal consultations are typically conducted through written submissions that outline the particular facts and circumstances on a named basis. So we so we'll know the name of the audit firm and, and the company. Um, often we receive formal consultation submissions from um, when in situations where a company is planning to go public and it would like to engage a particular audit firm, um, which is usually the incumbent auditor, but not always. Um, so they want to engage a particular firm to conduct audits under PCOB standards. And in evaluating the independence of the prospective firm, the, the company and the firm may have identified certain services or relationships um, that, that are relevant to the audit and professional engagement period that they're looking at and that would be impermissible under our rules. And so we'll consider the details of those fact patterns. Um, and we'll, we, we really look to the, the conclusions of the company management, the audit committee of the company, or if there's no audit committee, those charged with governance, and then the audit firm as well. And really looking at the, the audit firm's objectivity and impartiality to conduct the required audits despite the, what would be a violation if they were to be engaged. Um, and so if we do not object to that, um, that fact pattern, um, we do expect that appropriate disclosure would be made by the company and its filing, SEC filing, to provide investors with relevant information, include the nature, including the nature of the, the independence violations and consideration of the firm's um, objectivity and impartiality. So that's a brief overview of our independence consultations process. And as I said, I will now turn to Jez Deep to present the next section, which is about, which is an overview of Rule 201. So next slide, please. And Jez Deep, on to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, my name is Jez Deep Mangad. And as Jennifer mentions, I'm a member of the independence team here at the SEC's Office of Chief Accountant. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, during this section, I will be providing you with an overview of the SEC's auditor independence rules as specified in Rule 201. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Can skip this one. Thank you. Since the SEC's creation in 1934, the need for auditors to remain independent has been consistently emphasized. Here in the US, it's the federal securities laws that reflect the importance of independent audit in protecting investors by requiring or permitting the commission to require that financial statements filed with the commission by public companies, investment companies, brokers and dealers, public utilities, uh, investment advisors, and others be certified or audited by independent public accountants and by granting the commission the authority to define the term independent. The commission's requirements regarding auditor independence can be found in rule 201 of regulation SX and in the interpretations, guidelines, and examples that are collected in section 600 of the codification of financial reporting policies uh, entitled matters relating to independent accountants. The commission also makes available, publicly available, the staff's written responses to requests for informal advice uh, on, its independence, on its independence requirements, um, or what we refer to as uh, frequently asked questions. The SEC's auditor independence rules went through a significant modernization process in late 2000, and then again in 2003. The objective and the purpose of these changes were in recognition of the changes that public accounting firms were undergoing 
specifically the broadening of services and relationships that those public accounting firms um, were offering. The changes continue to reflect the need for the financial reporting process to ensure that investor protection remained paramount in everything that we do here at the Commission. Since then, the Commission has gone through the process of revising its auditor independence rules once in 2019, which was referred to as the um, amended loan rule, and most recently in October of 2020, which Vasilios will be providing you an overview with. In the U.S., private companies undergoing an initial public offering and existing public companies, they're also referred to as the 33 and 34 Act filers, must comply with the SEC's independence rules. Additionally, registered investment companies, registered investment advisors, unregistered funds and brokers and dealers also must comply with SEC's Rule 201. Next slide, please. The SEC's Rule 201 was designed to ensure that auditors of public companies are qualified and independent of their audit clients in both fact and appearance. The construct of Rule 201 includes principles-based considerations, which are outlined in Rule 201B. It further describes prohibitions against certain financial, employment, and business relationships between an accountant and its audit clients as well as restrictions in the provision of certain non-audit services to audit clients, all of which are covered by Rule 201C. And last but not least, Rule 201 provides definitional guidance as well as other technical guidance that accountants must comply with when conducting audits of financial statements for public companies. Um, For example, ensuring timely and proper Uh, communications with audit committees and partner rotation requirements, having robust quality controls in place, et cetera. Next slide, please. So I just mentioned Rule 201 provides for principles-based considerations, which are covered by Rule 201B, or what's also referred to as the general standard. The general standard states that the commission will not recognize an accountant as independent If the accountant is not or a reasonable investor with knowledge of all relevant facts and circumstances would conclude that the accountant is not capable of exercising objective and impartial judgment. If you recall, I stated earlier that Rule 201 was designed to ensure that auditors are independent in both fact and appearance. Excuse me. You may question how one evaluates or assesses independence in appearance. It's here in the general standard where we emphasize that a reasonable investor with knowledge of all relevant facts and circumstances would conclude that the accountant is not capable of exercising objective and impartial judgment. This reasonable investor test is how one evaluates an accountant's independence in appearance. Next slide, slide, please. Now, we can't talk to you about Rule 201B and the general standard without reference to the introductory note to Rule 201. Prior to the October 2020 amendments, the introductory note was titled the preliminary note. The introductory note enhances the general standard and provides four general principles indicative of a relationship or a provision of a service that would impair independence. Specifically, an accountant's independence would be impaired if a service or relationship One, creates a mutual or conflicting interest between the accountant and the audit client. Two, places the accountant in the position of auditing his or her own work. Three, results in the accountant acting as management or an employee of the audit client. And four, places the accountant in the position of being an advocate for the audit client. Next slide, please. I spent a little time covering the introductory note and Rule 201B. However, as I mentioned earlier, Rule 201 covers much more than this. So Rule 201C describes prohibitions against certain financial relationships, employment relationships, and business relationships. It also covers the provision of of certain non-audit services to audit clients, certain fee arrangements with audit clients, and it also describes certain requirements in the administration of audit engagements by the audit firm, such as partner rotation requirements, audit committee communications, 
and compensation arrangements of auditors. Next slide, please. So I'll focus the remainder of my time here to highlight to you um, specifically Rule 201C4, which describes the prohibition of certain non-audit services an accountant may com consider providing to its audit clients. Please keep in mind that the list that you see before you is non-exclusive. It's a non-exclusive list, so the rules cannot be and they do not contemplate every service that may arise. So this is one of the reasons why Rule 201B and the general standard are integral to the, the evaluation of an auditor's independence. The rule set forth that an accountant is not independent if the accountant provides any of these non-audit services to an audit client at any point during the audit and professional engagement period. The services in red, bookkeeping, financial information systems, design and implementation, and management functions are the services that we tend to receive questions on more frequently in the consultations uh, that come to us, so that consultation process that Jennifer just mentioned to you, both informal and, and formal consultations. Um, now I'm going to pass it over to Vasilios, who's going to be providing you with an overview of the recent amendments to Rule 201. Thank you. Vasilios? Thank you, Jasdeep. Next slide, please. Um, good morning, everybody. As, as you are aware, the Commission adopted targeted amendments to the independence requirement in Rule 2-1 of Regulation SX in October 2020. It also approved the PCOB's corresponding conforming amendments earlier this year. These targeted amendments were informed by comments on the December um, 2019 proposal, as well as decades of staff experience in consulting with firms and others regarding application practice of the auditory dependence framework. The final amendments focus the analysis on relationships and services that are more likely to pose threats to an auditor's objectivity and impartiality. As you can tell from this slide, the Commission amended Rule 2-01 in several areas, primarily related to the definitions of affiliate of the audit client, investment company complex, and audit and professional engagement period. In addition, amongst other changes, the Commission updated certain requirements relating, relating to certain loans or debt or creditor relationships, as well as the business relationships rule had adopted amendments to address inadvertent violations of the independence requirements as a result of mergers and acquisitions. To help bring some of the changes to life, I would like to outline one example related to the affiliate of the audit client definition. Prior to the recent amendments, an auditor had to be dependent of the entity under audit and all other entities that were under common control with the entity under audit. In a private equity group structure, for example, this resulted in the auditor of a portfolio company being required to be dependent of all other portfolio companies that were also controlled by the same private equity group. After the recent rule amendments, an entity, let's call it entity B, that is under common control with an entity other audit, let's call it entity A, would be considered an affiliate of A only if both B and A are material to the entity that controls both of them. Let's call it entity C. If, for example, B is not material to C, the auditor of A could provide certain non-audit services to B that would no longer be considered to be impermissible under the amended rules. I would, I would also like to note that in regard to the business relationships rule, 
as noted in, in the slide, the Commission replaced the reference to substantial stockholders with the concept of beneficial owners with significant influence, uh, or BORSI. Uh, this is similar to the concept that was used in the amended loan rule. Otherwise, with regard to business relationships, there was no intention to make any other changes, add or apply the business relationships rule differently going forward. Next slide, please. Another change is that in an initial registration statement, similar to the existing requirement applying to foreign private issuers, an auditor for a domestic issuer will have to be dependent under the SEC and PCOB dependence requirements only for the latest year included in the initial registration statement and with local dependence requirements for the look back years. However, the general standard also continues to apply to all years included in a registration statement, including the look back years for which the auditor has to be dependent under the local requirement. As stated in the adopting release, nothing in the final amendments is intended to change the application of the general independent standard in Rule 2-1B. Rule 2-1B applies to those relationships and services that previously were, but are no longer, covered by Rule 2-1C as a result of the final amendments. We believe this is appropriate and do not believe that this position broadens the scope of the all relevant facts and circumstances concept in the general standard. We want to share with you, as an example, how we have been approaching the following question that we are getting a lot uh, lately. Audit firms have been calling us asking how to implement the look back provision in a situation where an existing private audit client is planning to go public through an, an, an initial public offering or um, most often lately um, a merger with a special purpose acquisition company, a SPAC. And the audit firm uh, was involved in some manner with preparing the financial statements of its private company audit client. In many of these scenarios, the audit firm was involved with preparing the financial statements for the 2019 fiscal year, with the work taking place during the 2020 fiscal year. In the scenario presented, the private company now needs financial statements for 2020 and 2019 audited other PCOB standards and in compliance with SEC and PCOB independence requirements. In considering this fact pattern, we have been advising the audit firms that because the general standard applies for all periods, to be included in a registration statement, the audit firm needs to consider the general standard for both 2019 and 2020. In the, in the scenario presented, the staff would view the audit firm as not being independent for 2019 or for 2020. That's because under the general standard, an auditor is not independent if he or she would be in a position of auditing his or her own work or if he or she acts as management. 
We also consider the appearance issues associated with an audit firm preparing financial statements for each audit client in this circumstance. I will now pass it over to Matt to talk through the last section. Thanks, Basilius. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, hi, my name is Matt Hodder, and I'm also an accountant in the SEC's Office of the Chief Accountant. Thus far, my colleagues have spoken about the SEC's independence rules, recent amendments to those rules, as well as the SEC's consultation process for auditor independence. However, in the United States, both the SEC and the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, or PCAOB, have the authority to establish auditor independence rules applicable to audits of issuers and broker dealers. I'm gonna take a few minutes to provide you with some background on the PCAOB's ethics and independent standards, including recent conforming amendments adopted by the PCAOB board in late 2020 and approved by the SEC in January, 2021. The, the authority for both the SEC and PCAOB to establish auditor independence rules applicable to audits of issuers and broker dealers comes from congressional statutes, namely the Sarbanes-Oxley of, uh, Act of 2002 and the Jobs Act of 2012, the latter of which as it pertains to the audits of broker dealers. The PCAOB PCAOB's independence rules work in concert with the SEC's independence rules, but do impose certain incremental independence obligations on registered public accounting firms. For example, additional prohibitions on tax services for persons in financial reporting oversight roles or FROR roles at issuer audit clients. Next slide, please. The PCOB's ethics and independent standards can be found on their public website under, uh, quote, rules of the board, end quote, in the 3500 series, also referred to as Section 3, Part 5. The 3500 series outlines the ethics and independent standards to be used, and that's in Rule 3500T, uh, includes definitions of certain terms, that's in Rule 3501, as well as the PCOB's independence rules that are incremental to those in the federal securities laws. And that's PCAOB's 3520 series rules, which are shown on this slide. A few items to, to quickly highlight. Rule 3523 prohibits, as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, rule 3523 prohibits tax services for persons in FROR rules. Rules 3524 and 3525 outline audit committee pre-approval requirements in addition to the SEC's rule 201C7. And um, at the bottom of the slide, rule 3526 requires communications from the audit firm regarding independence prior to the initial engagement as the auditor and annually thereafter. Next slide, please. Now that I've provided an overview of the PCOB's ethics and independent standards, I'll provide you with a quick summary of some recent amendments. In late 2020, the PCO, PCAOB made targeted conforming amendments to their interim independent standards and rules of the board that revised a portion of the board's interim independent standards included in PCAOB rule 3500T also revised certain definitions and terms included in PCAOB rule 3501 and deleted a portion of the board's interim independent standards included in PCAOB rule 3500T. Now, the, the purpose of these amendments was to um, avoid differences between the SEC and PCAOB independence rules, avoid duplicative requirements, and to provide greater regulatory certainty. As with all rules of the board and PCA, PCAOB standards, once the rules are adopted by the PCAOB board, they must be approved by the SEC before they are effective. And I wanna highlight a few points regarding the SEC's approval process. 
first, it, it's a formal process outlined in the federal securities laws. Next, the SEC's approval comes from the SEC's five member commission in a formal vote. The SEC staff does not have the authority to approve PCAOB rules, but we are involved in the process and make recommendations to the commission. And the SEC's approval process results in a ratification vote. While there is additional public comment during the SEC's approval process, the commissioners cannot vote to make any changes to the rule. They can only vote yes or no on the ratification. Um, so as I noted on the slide, the, the PCOB's conforming amendments were approved by the SEC in January 2021 and have the same effective date as the SEC's recent amendments from October 2020. Um, next slide, please. And with, with that, um, that concludes our remarks and the staff um, really appreciates the opportunity to, to present to this group and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate this you know, tremendous uh, uh, update that uh, you've given us an educational update on uh, uh, the SEC. It's very informative. Uh, I can say as a, uh, a former practitioner years ago that the consultation uh, process is particularly, I, I think, unique uh, in as much as it, uh, you know, I, I'd frequently have questions and I knew someone that I could turn to. I didn't always like the answers that came back, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, there wa was a, uh, a methodology to, to get an answer to a question. So with that, uh, uh, let me uh, open it up to the group. Uh, any questions that you'd like to uh, bounce off this uh, uh, esteemed group of people from the SEC? Uh, Natasha? Great, yes, thank you. And thank you so much for that presentation. That was really, really helpful. Um, I, I have a couple of, of questions, really sort of practical. Um, first of all, I, I'd be really interested in the extent to which these sorts of amendments, uh, particularly around independence, which I think is a super critical issue for investors and the integrity of the market, um, to what extent are they driven by queries from investors? Um, I know you talked about the informal process and the formal process. I don't know whether you have stats on the extent to which investors are the drivers for, for, for those and then the extent to which that leads to the sorts of amendments you've been describing. Um, my, my second question relates to um, the principles-based portion of, um, uh, of the SEC rules. Uh, and, and it's really to ask whether there have been any examples of where auditors have been found, I, I don't know what the term would be, but you know, um, not in keeping with that principles-based rule. I mean, are, are those cases that you, you um, presumably publish on your website? Thank you. So maybe, maybe I can just take the first one, so thanks Thanks for the question, Natasha. Um, the first one, as I understand it, I think you're interested in to what extent are investors um, maybe bringing questions to us related to independence. Um, I think that's the, the gist of it, um, if I got that right. So that's I think, it, I would say usually in, in facilities, I know has more, has a longer, um, longer you know, years of experience with, in terms of answering independence questions. We don't typically get questions directly from investors. Um, it's more likely to be, as I mentioned, audit firms or companies or law firms you know, on behalf of companies. But um, you know, sometimes I think their, their questions are triggered by discussions they may have had um, you know, just throughout the organizations. It could be with investors, it could be with audit committees. Um, but we don't get that many questions directly from from investors through our consultations process. Um, and I think, and maybe you could, I'll just pause there to see if Vasilius wanted to add anything. Otherwise, we could, we could go to your second question. No, I, I agree. Generally, we, we do not get um, any questions from investors, directly from investors. And maybe I just jump in. I mean, that, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, again, it's a bit of a kind of peeve of mine, but. 
as you said very clearly at the beginning, one of the goals of the entire exercise is to protect investors. And yet the core constituency to which you're oriented is not itself saying, look, we, we have concerns here about independence and, and we would like you to have a look at that. So I don't know whether there's outreach to investors or, or, or other work of such nature that, that has been done by the SEC, but, but um, that, that would be interesting. I think it's a good question. I think you know, as, as, we, as we always know, we don't know um, as investors read the disclosures, because I mentioned there are disclosures um, about other independence um, for companies, particularly when there are violations and they, and they make disclosures about what the nature of those were. Um, we don't know to what extent, you know, investors read that information and either, you know, appreciate it and don't have questions or, you know, maybe direct the questions, you know, back to the companies themselves. So I think that's an area where uh, it's interesting. I just, I just don't have the information as to, you know, um, how they react to those disclosures, for example. So I think that's always, you may know as well, I think it's always difficult as a regulator to, um, to get input from investors um, I think that's been a, a common problem across, you know, standard setting bodies and, and regulators as well as trying to get investors engaged in some of these issues. And it could be that they, they do appreciate, you know, these processes, but we just don't hear from them as directly as we, as we might hope. Um, they do send in the comment letters occasionally as they did on the, um, you know, the independence rulemaking, but, um, but it's an interesting area to, to think more about. And maybe you could just repeat your second question again, that'd be helpful. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for that as well. Uh, just briefly, you, you talked about the principles based element of the SEC rules when it comes to independence of the reasonable investor test. I, I wondered whether in practice you have ever had cases where auditors have been found not to be compliant with that. So I can, I can kick that one off. I think it does come up, and I don't know if you're speaking in terms of cases, in terms of you know, formal enforcement cases versus um, sort of questions we get through our process. Um, you know, as Vasilia has mentioned, I think recently the, the questions that we're getting around financial sta statement preparation um, done by, by an accounting firm and then how that impacts um, the, the, the company's ability to, you know, to hire the particular audit firm, particularly with, with these new rules and the new look back period. Um, it is very much a discussion about the general standard and the, the sort of the principles-based aspect of that, the, the four principles. Um, so we do, in our discussions with, with firms, we do bring up, up the four principles quite frequently and making sure that they're keeping that top of mind in, in addition to the, you know, the, the detailed rules that, that Jazdeep outlined. Um, I think it does come up as well in the enforcement cases. I guess I'll I'll stay away from the specifics of the, of the enforcement cases, but it, it is something that, again, is, is considered. And certainly I'll pause and see if others on the team want to add anything there. I, th I think the only thing I, I would add there is it's, it's definitely, um, you know, something that, that's up for consideration for the Division of Enforcement um, when they're making a case. It's, it's probably, you know, without having, you know, statistics in front of me, it's, it's, I, you know, my view, probably not something that comes up quite as often, um, but, but there's, you know, anything that's out there would be, um, you know, in the, the enforcement releases and is eventually publicly available. Um, and, and yeah, just to, you know, agree with Jennifer's comments that, um, you know, the, the principles based aspect of the rules definitely, you know, comes up in, in basically every consultation we do, whether it's formal or informal, it's, it's, it's always a consideration. Thank you so much. So uh, I, I saw Hussein uh, raised his, uh, his hand a little while ago. Uh, Hussein. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for presentation. Uh, just, uh, I was wondering uh, uh, the uh, application of uh, this uh, question, uh, in implementation of these independence rules uh, uh, I think uh, a little bit uh, subjective. Uh, uh, just I was wondering, uh, do you have any cases uh, uh, of a violation of independence rules? And then uh, which one is uh, more common? Could, could you please give some example to us? 
actually uh, we have similar uh, rules, uh, but uh, up to now, uh, actually, I think our audit firm uh, most probably uh, comply with uh, uh, audit uh, ob object uh, uh, independence rules, and then therefore we couldn't have any cases uh, of violation of uh, independence rules. Thank you. Thanks, Hussein. Let's let's take a few other comments before they respond to that one because it's it's a fairly broad question. Takashi, uh, did you had a you have a comment? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Geran. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good evening from Japan. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, very, very helpful. Uh, very informative presentation. Thank you for that, first of all. Um, uh, after I heard uh, your explanation, I could very understood the, uh, the, I, in the last October 2020 revision. Especially, I am very interested in the definition of the affiliate of audit clients. Uh, this definition was revised uh, because uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the scope of the related entity in the SX code uh, in the S at the ESRA, uh, there are a lot of discussion, uh, the scope of related entity, in, especially in the NAS uh, non-assurance service project and also a fee project. So I'm very interested in this definition changes, changing. And uh, I I think, uh, for example, like a uh, uh, subsidiary in the fund corporate, corporate group, uh, as you explained, the uh, uh, private equity uh, group, uh, this uh, definition change might have the effect of the increasing the number of companies uh, that are uh, affiliated of audit client, but are not subject to strict independence requirements, uh, such as a uh, provision of uh, on providing non-audit services. So it, it, with regard to this point, I want to ask you uh, if you have, uh, what kind of reaction of this, uh, to this change do you have from various stakeholders? Uh, most of people are welcome for this, or if uh, there are someone, people who had a concern for uh, or opposed to this change, what kind of concerns they have uh, if you have a uh, very uh, helpful for us, uh, for example, uh, as I mentioned, uh, that the scope of related entities, we, uh, we have a uh, little concern related to the fee or NAS project, NAS project. So it will be very helpful, uh, not only yes, but also our CAGWICH members. Uh, if you have any lessons, uh, also you, we can have, we can lesson, we can learn from this uh, revision for the future uh, our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Takashi and, uh, and Jim Dawkin. Uh... I was just reflecting on the comments and wanted to see from an SEC perspective, whether they consider, I guess they call them rules. So is it that they have more of a rules-based or prohibitions-based independent standard or is it more, you know, which, which do they, which way would you classify it, or is it a hybrid? Uh, and and Kachita, Kachita, you want to weigh in? Um, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, I appreciate very much the uh, presentation and also the seeming uh, sensitivity of the SEC in uh, reviewing and enhancing uh, regulations uh, with respect to the independence of the auditors. Uh, my, my inquiry or point of clarification is what would have driven uh, the SEC in coming up with these continuing enhancements? Were there incidents of uh, impairment or uh, lack of independence in past cases that because there are no rules or guidelines uh, on them that the enhancements were made. Thank you. 
Thanks, Conchita. Uh, Jennifer, I'm not sure how you're, you want to approach, uh, repro approach that. Uh, but some very general questions. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Galen. And thanks everybody for the questions. These are, these are great questions. Um, so maybe I'll just take, maybe I'll take um, Jim's first in terms of, I think just, you, I think you asked about sort of rules versus principles. Or, or is it a hybrid? Um, we do refer to the rules because um, as, as Jezdeep outlined, the requirements are really housed within what we call rule 201 of regulation SX. So we refer to it as really the rule or rule 201. Um, but there's also, but I, I do think of it as a hybrid approach because there are, are the principles, the four principles that we mentioned, the general standard of independence, in addition to the detailed um, requirements, because we do, and I think Jesse mentioned this in her remarks that, you know, the commission realized that you can't possibly contemplate all the different services and all the different scenarios and situations that an auditor might find itself in with respect to an audit client. So I think those were the, that's where the principles are, are important um, to make sure that those are, that those cover the other, you know, the various scenarios that might arise or, or evolve. Um, in terms of the other questions, um, I was thinking maybe, maybe Basilios could speak to, I think um, Hussein, your question was about common violations um, of, of independence. Uh, I, I think Jazdeep mentioned this a little bit. Um, I think we see a lot of non-audit services um, violations of various types, but I don't know, Basilios, maybe if you wanna to speak to that a bit. Um, a, a lot of, um, of the consultations that um, we get from the firms, um, they have to do um, with violations like um, where the firm is not independent because they have provided um, legal services or, or, or management services um, in, in their private or client or, um, or, or, or they have provided um, internal audit or uh, computer related services to, to, to their audit client. Um, in, in regards to bookkeeping, um, it, it's not as often. Um, I think by now, like uh, um, we don't see, at least from, from the large firms, we don't see it very often. Uh, from the smaller firms, of course, bookkeeping, it's something that uh, they do for their, for their private audit clients. Um, including preparation of the financial statements and um, calculating the tax provision and uh, calculating stock compensation um, and other similar um, accounting calculations. So, so in, in, our cons in, in our consultation experience, we do see pretty much um, most of, of um, um, the, the C4 prohibited, prohibited services uh, violations. Uh, either being done um, to the entity under audit or to a subsidiary or, um, or to an affiliated company. Yeah, thanks, Priscilla. Um, and in terms of the other questions, um, Takashi and Conchita, I think they're maybe somewhat related. So I think one of the questions was about um, changes to, I may call it changes to the affiliate rule um, really changes to the audit client definition as well um, about, and so this is where the changes to the, maybe the affiliate definition come up in the recent amendments. Um, in terms of, uh, maybe I'll just speak broadly about, I think one of the questions was what has driven the SEC to make changes. Um, and, and so when the commission looked at um, changing the rules when they put out the proposal in, in 2019, some of it came from feedback that was received when they had earlier done the loan rule um, changes back in 2019. And so I, what constituents pointed out is that um, just over time, there have been, there are areas where the independence rules as they, as they have been um, written and applied result in some violations that really um, don't impact auditor objectivity and impartiality, um, situations where maybe between the audit firms and companies and audit committees, they're spending a lot of time looking at, at looking at violations that are not as impactful. Um, and maybe 
some of the more significant ones get lost sort of in the, because of the large population that they sometimes have to talk through. So it was an effort to really try to focus on those um, services and relationships and that, that really have, have a greater risk to auditor independence. And that's where the, where the commission um, decided to make changes. And so you'll see some of that in the changes to the affiliate definition, which, which I think will impact some of those larger, you know, private equity firms that have very large structures, lots of companies involved, um, where it may, you know, it, it may end up that some of those entities are no longer going to be considered affiliates of the audit client if they're um, under common control. And Vasilios went through an example here where if, if there's a new dual, dual materiality test related to that to, to see whether um, those whether particular entities would be considered affiliates. Um, and really in terms of the reaction that we that we got to the changes, I think, um, so there were certainly reactions to the proposal. I would say on, you know, on balance, most of the comments were positive. There were, there were some um, that were not in favor of, of the proposed changes. Um, and in terms of the questions we've been getting so far, um, I think it's maybe too early to tell on some of the changes around definition of affiliates and some of those other changes in terms of what the impact will be. Um, as we mentioned, as Vasilia mentioned, a lot of the questions we're getting are really focused on this, this new look back period um, that came through under the, the revised definition of audit and professional engagement period, um, where I'll call it sort of full compliance with SEC and PC independence rules is only required for the most recent year that would be included in the filing. And the, the back years, um, we require you know, um, compliance with the local standard, whatever the local set of standards. However, plus, and this is where I think people are maybe not realizing what's in the adopting release, it's local rules plus, plus the um, general standard of independence and the principles. So that's something we're trying to emphasize. But, so those are most of the questions we've gotten so far. So I know I've said a lot, let me, let me pause there and see if others on, the, on, on my team wanna respond and then see if there are any clarification questions. Uh, no, I think the only other thing that I would add would be that uh, in regard to the definition of affiliate, um, after we made the change, it is uh, more closely aligned with um, the profession's definition of affiliate. Uh, Jim Dawkins, did you did you have anything to come back on, Jim, or you're good? No, okay, thank you. Uh, I I did have just kind of wrap this up because we're we're sort of out of time. But uh, uh, looking at the two regimes, uh, the SEC and PCOB, and the uh, IASBA code, the IASBA code has this conceptual framework and the idea of threats and safeguards. Uh, Jennifer. The SEC, I'm sure, has thought about this. I, I just wondered, in light of Laura's presentation earlier, Laura Friedrich, on you know the benchmarking, did, did you have anything that you might want to, any observations you might want to say about safeguards and threats and kind of the approach that we take in the code? It kind of puts you, puts you on the spot. I understand. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, not nothing specific on threats, threats and safeguards. Um, you know, we just don't have that approach, and so um, we're certainly interested in in the benchmarking project and and what will come out of that in terms of the comparison. So, just say we're looking forward to to learning more as well and seeing where the, the differences and, and similarities are. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for you, uh, Jennifer, and your entire team. We appreciate your uh, willingness to spend some time with us here today. Uh, with with that, though, uh, we'll we'll let you go, and we are scheduled for, I believe, a twenty minute break now, if I'm not mistaken, Jeff. So, yep. so what time are we coming back? Uh, twenty after the hour, or That's thereabouts. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all very much.